It's a pleasure tonight to welcome Eleanor Lippman to talk about not one but two new books she has out. Uh, Eleanor is the author of 10 novels, including one of my favorites and probably one of yours, uh, called And Then She Found Me. She also tweeted her way through the last election and then published a book called Tweet Land of Liberty, Irreverent Rhymes from the Political Circus. She's here to discuss her collection of essays, I Can't Complain, which covers territory ranging from the heartwarming How to Get Religion about the improbable functionality of a crazy blended family to the heartbreaking essay, This Is For You, about her husband's decline. And she's also just written The View from Penthouse B, which from its very first pages is signature Eller, Eleanor Lippman, warm, sharp, and very funny. Please help me welcome Eleanor Lippman. Thank you. Uh, I know that was built. This is a discussion. I'm actually going to read uh, short things from each. I should start with a chapter from the novel and then um, a short essay. And even though I'm not starting at the beginning, I picked a chapter that's short and I think stands by itself. And it's the narrator is named Gwen Laura Schmidt. Gwen, La, Gwen Laura is hyphenated and uh, called Gwen. And she has moved in. She's a widow of about two years. And she's moved in with her sister, who has been, someone just made up, the, made up this n verb for me, whose sister's been made off. Her sister has lost all her money. But what she's been left with is uh, an apartment, a uh, penthouse apartment on West 10th Street in Greenwich Village. Oh, so what I'm reading is, it's really what we would call, I guess in Hollywood, backstory, which is um, sort of the beginning, the middle, and the end of Gwen's relationship meeting her husband. So, here we go. This is chapter four, and the husband's name was Edwin. Though I used to leave my retail employment off my resume, I look back on it now with pride and nostalgia. To escape the long, solitary confinement of my proofreading cubicle, I became a buyer in training, despite being not terribly well-suited or well-dressed enough to catch the eye of managers who might promote me. The job was the result of more parental networking, a propitious conversation between my mother and a stranger at a bridge tournament. And though a wrong turn professionally, it turned out to be the high point of my romantic history because Edwin and I met on the mezzanine level of Nordstrom in Farmington, Connecticut, in what now seems another life. It was luck or kismet or just being on the right shift at the right time. The store's famously unreliable piano player, Victor, had come to work drunk. <laughs> No, sorry, I do not take requests, we sales associates in training heard him say. He ranted about the stupid cliched songs Americans always requested, which, led, which then led to a sarcastic rendition of Chim Chim Cheri. <laughs> he punctuated his tirade with swigs from a styrofoam cup, its contents clearly alcohol. When he stopped playing altogether and started muttering, presumably obscenities in Russian, Acoustics were wonderful in his area. <laughs> Two security guards rushed over. Sir, said the lead guard, reaching for his walkie-talkie, a hand on Victor's shoulder. Don't touch me, Victor yelled. I think it's time for your break, said the guard. <laughs> Have I mentioned that we all knew Victor and all knew he was an emigre from Irkutsk who liked to assert his new American right to swear in two languages at anyone who policed the state, even if the state consisted of Nordstrom, Lord and Taylor, and Emporium Armani? <laughs> Those of us in adjacent apartments were edging as close as we dared, tucking our IDs into our pockets so we could mingle with the curious shoppers. Don't let him drive, someone called to the guards. Name a musician who owns car, Victor yelled back. And where in hell would I park in US of A even if I owned little Japanese shitbox? <laughs> a guard sniffed the contents of the styrofoam cup and pronounced with too much glee and stereotyping, vodka. Big detective, Victor sneered. 
Now the head of HR was at the top of the escalator and race walking toward the piano. We display salespeople move several yards into the crowd, back towards our departments. The reason a random Russian separation from the store is relevant to my social history is that while all of this was unfolding, a customer named Edwin Schmidt was buying athletic socks in the shoe department. He first heard the music stop mid-passage, then a discordant bass cl bass clunk of keys as if a big angry fist had attacked the keyboard. Then he heard Ray's voices. He abandoned the package of socks under consideration, hopped on the t up escalator, and came toward the noise. Arriving as both guards were raising Victor from the piano bench, he stayed after the crowd had dispersed and gestured toward the piano's keyboard. He motioned to the HR woman, may I play a few pieces I know by heart? He admitted later that he was showing off, starting with a gorgeous list impromptu that drew sighs from the assembled shoppers and rubberneckers. The HR woman smiled the smile of someone who thinks it's her lucky day in her own bit of genius recruiting. Do you play other stuff, she asked. With barely a pause between pieces, Edward switched into a, Edwin switched into a beautifully mournful rendition of All You Need Is Love. Are you a professional? Yes and no, I'm a music teacher. The HR woman asked where, what time school got out, and whether his weekends were free. He said, West Hartford, 3 p.m., and yes, did she need references? <laughs> My office is downstairs, a right turn after the restrooms. Come by on your break, so I should keep playing? Let's get you into a jacket and tie first. Follow me, and then we'll call the next hour an audition. Before he left with a gift certificate toward the purchase price of his new sports jacket <laughs> and a voucher for our cafe, he played Rogers and ha Hart, Rogers and Hammerstein, Stephen Sondheim, more Beatles, and more impromptus. He returned that night with sheet music and without being told, played songs that conjured snow, snowmen, winter. It was our huge February coat sale. <laughs> No wedding ring on those talented fingers, my co-workers and I all noticed. Gay, a few ignoramuses con concluded, because of his artistic gifts. I wondered aloud to Meredith and Taisha in hosiery if our ma maestro was available. Both young and adventurous, they claimed the next move was up to me. When I did nothing, Taisha, safely married and on my behalf, strode to the piano and asked if he was married or seeing anyone. He looked up. She must have mentioned my name because there was a direct gaze into hosiery, then a switch to a song I didn't recognize. I might have turned away, but Meredith was there, back up to Taisha's bold overtures, prompting me to answer. I smiled and shrugged, sorry, can't name that tune. His right hand crossed over his left to punctuate his answer with one last chord. He called across the mezzanine, It's Always by Irving Berlin. He wrote it for his wife. I'm sure our three faces fell. Taisha must have said something like, So you are married? Even from a distance, I could see him trying to take back the impression the lyrics had falsely suggested. He said something to Aisha, who then yelled to me, Get over here, missy. <laughs> Time for your break. Lipstick, Meredith commanded. Was there ever a less subtle exercise in matchmaking? I made a slow walk over to the piano, trying to look unruffled and innocent, as if I didn't know what their conversation had been about. With a sly smile, Edwin pronounced to the passers-by, passers -by, I'm now going to play A Pretty Girl is Like a Melody, also by the late, great Irving Berlin. I was 30. No one had ever played a song for me without my first having requested it. Over coffee, I asked him to dinner at my new, barely unpacked studio apartment, and he accepted. Sometimes you see gestures that tell you everything about a person's character and temperament, and that night I saw many such signs. First among them was his good humor after my scallops turned out to be ammoniated <laughs> and nearly inedible. 
Edwin turned down my offer of substitute tuna sandwiches and celery sticks for a spontaneous outing to an Italian bistro in my neighborhood. We discovered that we shared two movies in common, Casablanca and Dirty Dancing, on our list of top five. <laughs> from that first night, I could so easily see myself across the table from him, who'd be relaxed and lenient about whatever I served. I could also see us taking trips together, nothing strenuous or exotic, Edwin sliding onto unoccupied piano benches aboard ships <laughs> and in restaurants, his staying calm when flights were canceled and luggage lost. I'd get a piano. He didn't make an overture in the direction of a kiss, so I did that myself, knowing that Meredith and Taisha would so scold me for a lost opportunity. He took it well. <laughs> he proposed on the one-year anniversary of Victor's termination with a ring that needed to be sized, so we waited until it was back from the jewelers to announce our plans. It had been his grandmother's will to Edwin upon her death. It was white gold and not exactly my taste, but I grew to love it. The diamond was flawless and noticed by every single customer of the chatty sort whose purchase I wrapped in tissue or whose credit card I ran. He always claimed he spotted me first across a crowded mezzanine, but I think everyone knew that was Edwin evoking as Ezio, Ezio Pinza in South Pacific. He stopped his freelance playing, and I returned to fixing other people's sentences when we moved to Manhattan and its Washington Irving High School. With our combined incomes and rent-controlled one bedroom, we didn't need second jobs. His students loved him. It was only 19 years later when the school's award-winning a cappella group brought the mourners to tears with amazing grace. It surprised me and broke my heart all over again when they closed with a slow, sweet, always. Everyone grasped its meaning. The way we'd met at a, Stanway, at a Steinway Grand had been Edwin's favorite illustration of how music could change a life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now for a change in tone. <laughs> This one, it's called, oh, so the essay collection, which came, was, is being brought out at the same time by Houghton Mifflin, um, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, and it's uh, divided into four sections. One is Meet the Family, uh, the second is On Writing, and then Coupling Columns, which were um, seven or eight that I wrote for, or maybe 10, for the Boston Globe, I was a rotating columnist. And then after that, there's a shorter chapter called Since Then, which is sort of update. Uh, so the one I'm reading <laughs> is from the family, Meet the Family. And where's my, oh. And it's called Sex Ed. <laughs> when my son was nine years old, a family friend gave him, why do our bodies stop growing? Questions about human anatomy answered by the Natural History Museum. <laughs> the illustrated book was a big hit, filled with the occasional half-goofy question like, is it true that you can eat an apple standing on your head, or is the skull one big bone? On page 88, Ben found question 132, the loaded one, which asked, when do I stop being a child? Beneath that were three paragraphs on puberty, including a sentence that got his attention. Quote, body changes in adolescence turns girls into young women who can have babies and boys into young men who can make women pregnant. That there was a connection between boys and babies had apparently never occurred to Ben. How, he asked, incredulous, do men make women pregnant? I the evolved parent at child's re child rearing sacred crossroads said, um, let's go ask daddy. <laughs> and then to prove it was science rather than cowardice added, he's a doctor. <laughs> daddy was watching TV. I repeated Ben's question. My husband said in a voice I didn't hear very often, therapeutic, pedagogical, Fred Rogers. Well, sure, I can answer that. Do you want to sit down? And truly, Planned Parenthood could have videotaped his presentation <laughs> and distributed it. 
the penis, the vagina, the sperm, the egg, logically, calmly, no smirking. Ben listened and didn't interrupt. When Bob finished, Ben asked, not coyly but suspiciously, how does the seed get in there? Remote control? <laughs> Bob said no. The man puts his penis into the woman's vagina. After a few moments of contemplation, Ben asked, do you have to get naked to do this? <laughs> Bob, sa Bob said, yes, you did. Did you and mom get naked? Bob said, I believe we did. <laughs> Our son stood up, exited the room, and yelled from the kitchen, I'm never doing that. <laughs> we waited for his return and his follow-up questions. I said, that was excellent. You couldn't have done any better. We'll see, said Bob. A few, days, a few days later at the kitchen table, Ben asked me as casually as he could, without looking up from his breakfast, how did girls get pregnant? I said, Ben, you remember, Daddy told you the whole story two nights ago. His tone changed to one of weary tolerance, as if I were the one who needed the refresher. Yeah, yeah, he said, I know. The man takes a seed out of his tush and the woman eats it. Well, why not? <laughs> it had its own charm. And I was, I was learning something valuable. One shouldn't push the facts of life too early. I'd like to think I corrected his misapprehension on the spot, but I don't remember doing so. School took the next step, a unit named Human Growth and Development, formerly known as Human Growth and Change, amended after some parent, this was a lab school at Smith College after all, worried that the word change would traumatize. That's true. The boys and girls were separated for the classes. The boys got, I swear, Mr. Weiner, it's true, <laughs> an experienced and married sixth grade teacher. Fifth grade proved to be good timing developmentally because Ben would study his vocabulary list without snickering. Again, Bob did the quizzing. Vulva, I heard him ask evenly from the next room. To which Ben would answer equally clinically, the external genital organs of the female. Vast deferens. The main duck that carries semen, our 10-year-old answered, as matter-of-factly as if the topic were Cotton Gin and Eli Whitney. Section two of Human Growth and Development was co-ed a year later in the spring of sixth grade. I asked Ben how that was going, boys and go girls together. It was fine, he said, his tone implying, why wouldn't it be? I asked how his friend Nathaniel was coping with this mature subject matter, because I knew from Nathaniel's mother that he still believed in the tooth fairy and Santa Claus. Ben answered as if venting a class-wide scorn over Nathaniel's reproductive IQ. Nathaniel, he didn't even know what PMS was. <laughs> seventh, seventh grade brought a new school in mid-year, a new unit called simply Health. Ben announced it at breakfast, sighing and saying, we start health today, a pause and a wry smile. I was his best audience and he knew it. Third year in a row, I learn about fallopian tubes. <laughs> he was an old hand. The teacher later told me that when Ben presented his special project on conjoined twins, featuring Chang and Eng, Barnum's famous act, he informed the class that both men had married. Long pause, shake of the head, then don't even ask about the honeymoon. <laughs> He's grown up now with his own place, a fruitful social life, and good sense. I'd like to thank Bob and Mr. Weiner, the playground, his bunkmates at camp, the locker room, the internet, and especially the talking transparent woman at Boston Museum, Boston's Museum of Science. It's an important job, and I couldn't have done it alone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before I read that, I, uh, my first reading was 
uh, Tuesday night in New York, and my son was there. So I, no, no, I asked him first, and I said, how would you feel if I read that? And he said, oh, it's okay. And then I, oh, and by the way, you got the PG version, by the way. And um, he said, do me a favor, though. Don't introduce me before you read it. <laughs> because everyone's going to be checking on me to see my reaction to it. So I didn't, but um, he's in much, he's in a lot, and the book is dedicated to him, the essay collection, and um, I think that's it on the Ben front, and I was just going to say, and of course, I hope you'll be thinking of questions, if you'll have questions, but I was just thinking, um, I forgot to say this at the two other readings, that um, something, I did something different with the novel. The last chapter, and this is not, uh, this, this, this is no, no spoiler alert needed, it's, it's just, the name of the chapter is Acknowledgements. It's not my acknowledgements, it's the acknowledgements come at the front of the book, so you wouldn't confuse it. But it was a bit of a debate, because it started that way, and it was just chapter 39, Acknowledgements, and it's my narrator, first person again, thanking the characters and her sister and Anthony, the roommate, and um, for everything. And it's sort of, you know, it's like the epilogue. And so there was a debate because a friend of mine who read it first said, no, you can't do that. Because everyone reads the, they go to the acknowledgments first and they'll end up reading and, you know, no. And then my editor and uh, agent said, 100%, you have to do that. So you can tell it makes me a little nervous that you'll think it ends before you get there. But Okay, don't forget, so thank you. Um, so I hope you'll have some questions. So always someone has to break the ice. Or I could ask myself a question. Was she, oh yes, hi. Oh, okay, can you, can, is this okay? So thanks for coming, because I've read, I think, most of your books and really enjoyed thank them. You. Thank and you. And I look forward to reading this one. So I was wondering, uh, uh, I guess I read a little bit of your bio online, and so you have one sister, right? I do. Who's older? Older. Uh-huh. Um, and I wondered if um, you're close and if you're a lot different than the sisters in the book. And, uh, and also where you got the idea for this story. Uh, the, I have an older sister, and it's dedicated to her because it's, she doesn't resemble in any way um, Margot. And in fact, I throw in an extra. There's three sisters in the book, and I probably violated some psychological like birth order thing because Betsy, the baby, is the sort of bossy, business-minded one, doesn't live with them, but she's bossy and judgmental, and yet, in the end, of course, all Lippmann characters are like all exceedingly nice, as we know. <laughs> so what difference does that make if she's a little bossy? Um, but... Um, then, where did I get the idea? Did I miss another question? If, how you're, if you and your sister are close, if you're, if you're we different personality-wise? We are, we are, yes, yes. And uh, um, similar, I would say, similar personalities, different, in, different interests, except politics. You know, if the, yeah, politics. If there's something, if she visited me, she lives in Boston, she was evacuated, she lives in the Prudential Center, she was evacuated, yeah. And she knows someone um, who lost yeah, um, a limb. Um, but so very close and, more, and closer now even than we were in, you know, growing up. She had no use for me when we were children. None. <laughs> none. And uh, so and where I got the idea, it started as kind of a boarding house novel comedy. And it was third person, and it was about um, still a person named Margot owned the penthouse, and she was also, had been made off, and she took in some borders, but it, you know, it was different, and then it came to a standstill, and I felt stuck, it wasn't going anywhere, and I had, yeah, so I dropped it and then you know things were happening my husband died and so I started up again uh, about six months of a break and I said um, I know I'll make her the narrator a widow who moves in with her sister and ironic I mean I thought at the time well this is very different because that my character has been um, it, very different. Not me. She's been widowed for two years. Very different. No resemblance whatsoever. <laughs> but it takes a while to write a book. And then I caught up. And then it was me, sort of. Not really, but yeah. So thank you. Thank, thanks.
Well, sorry. Uh, no, I'll she be. was there first, uh, so it only made sense. Well, first, I'd like to say that I like your writing, and uh, I was part, have to admit I was partly drawn to it because uh, you spell your first name the same way I do. Oh, we love that. And that's rare. Yes. <laughs> um, I. Obviously, you do different kinds of writing, and I'd like to hear more about your style in writing. And do you write? Are you working on more than one thing at once, and that sort of thing? You know, I'm. If I am, I mean, the I made that pledge. You know, went to a conference in Aspen and was teaching there, and the pledge, oh, and people said, you should tweet, and an agent from my agency said, oh, you have to tweet, and it's good for this, and it's good for that, and, and you know, you'll end up, you could be like, um, what's her name, um, oh, Susan Orlean with like 200,000, like, Twitter followers. And um, so I went home and I thought, oh, you know, what am I going to say? You know, just back from the airport, long line, long taxi line. <laughs> so I didn't want to do that. So I said, I know, I'll write a rhyming political tweet every freaking day. Only I only add the freaking now because it was, I never skipped a day except two Yom Kippur's. And I'm not even observant, but I thought it was a good excuse. <laughs> Um, so I did, it was, ended up being 500 tweets in a row and it ended up being a book, Tweet Land of Liberty. So I was doing that and writing the novel and, you know, it looks as if these were all cotemporaneous, but the novel, the, uh, was sort of, essays were collected going back at least 20 years and then up to the present. And then the novel, when I finished it about a year ago, and did the final revisions a year ago. Then I wrote the updated ones, the one in the section called Since Then. So. And do you have a particular writing schedule? And I, when I'm actually working on a novel, I try to start about 8 in the morning and then do, try to do 500 words. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, if, and if that comes too soon... <laughs> that if that comes too soon, then I I keep going. If it's a quick five hundred words, then I keep going, so I don't feel you know like a total bum. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And you know, our spelling of Eleanor is a sense and sensibility. One of the sisters. Yes. Of course, we yes. all Eleanors know that. Very yeah. literary. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else? Because you hate to. Th oh, yes. I'll use the mic. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, the person at the mic can go first. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Extra credit. Oh, good. Uh, no. um, well, I'm a big fan of all your work. And uh, actually, two of my favorites, uh, The Inn at Lake Divine and, um, uh, of course, Can I guess? I'm gotten Shy and I can't remember. Uh, go ahead. And, yeah, please guess. <laughs> um, Isabel's Bed? Oh, I love Isabel's Bed. But no, that's not the one I meant. Ooh. My Latest <laughs> Grievance. Oh, um, my latest grievance? Yeah. Oh, I'm so I happy. Well, and I think I've, part of it is in, in The Inn at Lake Divine and, and uh, The Latest Grievance, the narrator's a kind of teenage girl. And you do that so well. And I wondered if you ever thought about doing any young adult work. Or I love both those characters so much. They're strong young girls, which I think is a, is a great model. So And so clever. And I mean, it's just great. Anyway, but so, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Start you know, in both cases... They, well, especially in my latest grievance, it's the adult Natalie. Oh, right, looking back. Frederica. Yeah. Natalie's in it like to find. The adult Frederica looking back. So I could give her the insights and the developed IQ of an older person. Mm -hmm. I have thought about it. Um, I have thought about a YA thing. I haven't done that yet. I had an idea that seemed different, not like my other books. And it was even a little tiny mysterious. But then... <laughs> I, when I start a new novel, I kind of start it, write a page, drop that. You know, another few pages, drop that. So that's one of the ones I dropped. Okay. But, um, you know, I would, it, because, I mean, who doesn't love, who, looking back, the, the YA books that I love, my favorite ever was Daddy Long Legs by Jean Webster. I read that book probably 30 times. I read it over and over again, all through high school. I yeah. do that too. I've read all um, yours several times too. So. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Way. And I'm, now I'm trying to remember with um, the 
with the In It Like Divine, it's mm-hmm. a little more the narrator is in that age. At she's, the when it opens, yeah. she's she's yeah, twelve and then or her, thirteen. The adult t- and I love that character as well. But it's, I think the young girls. Oh, are, thank you. We're good. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> um, you. So. That was the last question, and I'll be signing books. And and I guess the books are on front. Uh, don't sneak out. Don't sneak out. Buy a book and come back here and talk to me. Okay, thank you so much.